Hey again, today we'll continue reading The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin, starting with chapter 25. Um, a lot of stuff happened in the last time we read because all the heirs were called back to the Westing house for the end of the game, the last reading of the will. Um, and they were all supposed to give Ed Plum, the lawyer, their answers. And um, everyone was wrong, so they were all left in a room together to discuss and um, come up with the final answer. They were given a set amount of time before the authorities were supposed to arrive on the scene, um, expecting to arrest someone for Sam Westing's murder. So all of the heirs agreed to pull their clues together, and they ended up finding out um, that Bertha Erica Crow's name was the answer to the riddle, meaning she was the answer to the Will's game um, that Sam Westing had set up. But... Judge Ford convinced them all to um, to defend Crow and not step up and give her name because she convinced them all that she was innocent since there's no proof that she killed anyone. And as she was doing this, she um, developed a theory that Sandy was Sam Westing and she was trying to, uh, to convince everyone of this. And as she was doing that, Sandy suddenly started choking and dropped to the floor. Um interrupting her theory and then Ed Plum and the authorities arrived back at the house and um, they determined that Sandy had died and Ed Plum uh, he said that the heirs had to give an answer so he started counting down um, from a couple of minutes and then Crow ended up re or confessing herself as the answer to the will um, because everyone else had agreed to protect her. Um, so that is where chapter 25 picks up. Chapter 25, Westing's Wake. Sandy was dead. Crow had been arrested. The 14 remaining heirs of Samuel W. Westing sat in Judge Ford's living room, wondering what had happened. At least the guilt is not on our hands, Mr. Who said, trying to convince himself that a clear conscious, conscience was worth $200 million. Crow's going to jail, Otis Amber wailed, and all you do is pat yourself on the back for not being a stoolie. Let me remind you that Crow confessed, Sidel Pulaski reminded him. Crow only confessed to being the answer, nothing more, Angela said, pressing her hand against the tearing pain in her cheek. Even if Sam Westing wasn't murdered, like the judge said, Doug Who argued, there was nothing wrong with Sandy until he drank from the flask Crow filled. If Crow is innocent, Theo said, that means the murderer is still here in this room. Flora Bombach tightened her grip on Turtle, who was nestled in her arms. Poor Crow, Otis Amber muttered. Poor Crow. Poor Sandy, you should say, Turtle responded angrily. Sandy's the one who's dead. Sandy was my friend. You should have remembered that before you kicked him, Dendendeer remarked. I never kicked Sandy, never. The intern turned sideways in his chair in case of attack, but the kicker stayed slumped in sadness. Well, someone kicked him today. That was mo one mean bruise he had on his shin. That's a lie. That's a disgusting lie, Turtle shouted. The only person I kicked today was Barney Northrup, and he deserved it. I didn't even see Sandy until tonight at the Westinghouse. Right, Baba? That's right, Florida Bombach said, handing Turtle a Westing facial tissue. But Turtle was not about to cry again in front of everybody, like a baby. If only she could forget how, sh how he looked, suffering, dying, the twisted body, the chipped tooth, that horrible twitch, that one eye, that was the worst, that one eye blinking. Sandy used to wink at her like that when he was alive, when he was alive. Turtle blew her nose loudly to keep from sobbing. Sandy was my friend too, Theo said. I was playing chess with him in the game room, but he didn't know I knew. Why is everybody lying? Turtle slumped further into Flora Bombach's arm. Sandy was her friend, not Theo's, and Sandy didn't know how to play chess. The judge, too, was surprised. How can you be certain it was Mr. McSuthers you're playing with, Theo? That's what partners are for. Doug watched the chess table to see who was moving the white pieces, Theo replied. Again, the track star thrust his I'm number one fingers high in the air. Dumb jock, thought Mr. Who. Doesn't he realize this is a wake? But he is the champ. My son's the champ. Doug wins, said Madame Who. They did not suspect her any more. Good, very good. But it was so sad about the door guard. Theo went on in a mournful voice. I'm sort of glad Sandy didn't go back to the chessboard after my last move. He never knew he lost the game. 
Did you checkmate him? The judge asked. Could she have been right about Miss McSuthers after all? No, a disguise was one thing, but Sam Westing lose a game of chess? Never. Well, not exactly checkmate, Theo replied, but Sandy would have had to resign. I took his queen. The queen's sacrifice! The famous Westing trap! Judge Ford was certain now, but there were still too many unanswered questions. I'm afraid greed got the best of you, Theo. By taking the White's queen, you were tricked into opening your defense. I know. I've lost a few games that way myself. Theo recalled the position of the chessman, thankful that his skin was too dark to reveal his blushing. Turtle almost smiled. That Theo thinks he's so smart. Well, Sandy showed him. Sandy beat him at chess. But Sandy didn't play chess, and she never kicked him either. Bucktooth Barney Northrup was the one she kicked, not Sandy. But Sandy had the sore shin. Bucktooth, Chiptooth, the, false cro the crooked false teeth in the dentist's office. Sandy's dentist. Cheer up, my friend. The game's not over. You can still win. I hope you do. Those were the last words Sandy said to her. He winked when he said that. Winked! One eye winked! Dead Sandy had winked at her! Sandy had winked! Oh my! Flora Bombach exclaimed as Turtle suddenly bolted from her arms. Angela, could I see your copy of the will? Angela handed it over. She could not refuse her sister anything now. Turtle leaned against the dark window, poring over Sidel Pulowski's transcript of the will. First, I returned to live among my friends and my enemies. I came home to seek my heir, aware that in doing so I faced death. And so I did. To seek my heir, Turtle repeated to herself. Today I have gathered together my nearest and dearest, my sixteen nieces and nephews. Sit down, Grace Windsor Wexler, to view the body of your Uncle Sam for the last time. Tomorrow its ashes will be, sh will be scattered to the four winds. Winds? Windclockle, Turtle said aloud. Her, her mother had been right all along about being related to Sam Westing. Windclopple, Grace mumbled. Jake patted her head. Windclopple, the judge repeated. At least she could explain that. Crow married a, name, a man named Windclopple, who then changed his name to Westing. Bertha Erica Crow was the former wife of Samuel W. Westing. They had one child, a daughter, who drowned the night before her wedding. It was rumored that she killed herself rather than marry the man her mother had chosen for her. If Sam Westing blamed his wife for their daughter's death, then the sole purpose of this game was to punish Crow. Crow was Sam Westing's ex-wife? The heirs found that hard to believe. Then why would Mr. Westing give her a chance to inherit the estate? Theo asked. M maybe he wanted his enemies to forgive him, Chris said. Ha! said Mr. Who, one of the enemies. Turtle read on. Second, I, Samuel W. Westing, hereby swear that I did not die of natural causes. My life was taken from me, by one of you. The police are helpless. The culprit is far too cunning to be apprehended for this dastardly deed. What does dastardly mean? Oh my, Flora Bombach was relieved to hear Jake Wexler define the word as cowardly. I alone know the name. Now it is up to you. Cast out the sinner, let the guilty rise and confess. Third, who among you is worthy to be the Westing heir? Help me. My soul shall roam restlessly until that one is found. For the first time since Sandy died, Turtle smiled. Judge Ford sat in glassy-eyed thought, elbows propped on the desktop, her chin resting on her folded hands. Why, indeed, was Crow an heir? Sam Westing could have pointed his clues at the Sunset Tower's cleaning woman without naming her an heir. Crow's not going to inherit anything, not if she's in jail for murder, Otis complained bitterly. All year talk about chess and sacrificing queens. Crow's the one who's been sacrificed. What did you say? the judge asked. I said Crow's the one who's been sacrificed. Uttering a low groan, Judge Ford sank her head in her hands. The queen sacrifice. She had fallen for it again. Westing had sacrificed his queen, Crow, distracting the players from the real game. Sam Westing was dead, but somehow or another he would make his last move. She knew it. She felt it deep in her bones. Sam Westing had won the game. Stupid, 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 she said. The heirs stared in amazement. First they are told that Samuel W. Westing was married to their cleaning woman. Now a judge is calling herself stupid. It couldn't be true. 
Sam Westing wasn't stupid, Denton Deer declared. He was insane. The last part of the will was sheer lunacy. Happy Fourth of July, he said. This is November. It's November 15th, Otis Amber cried. It's poor Crow's birthday. Turtle looked up from the will. Crow's birthday? Sandy had bought a striped candle for his wife's birthday, a three-hour candle. The game is still on. Sam Westing came back to seek his heir. You can still win. I hope you do, he said. How? How? It is not what you have. It is what you don't have that counts. Whatever it was she didn't have, she'd have to find it soon, without letting the, other knows, the others know what she was looking for. Judge Ford, I'd like to call my first, first witness. Chapter 26 Turtle's Trial Who was furious? Haven't we had enough game playing, he complained, and led by a confessed bomber, no less. Judge Ford rapped for silence with the walnut gavels presented to her by associates on her appointment to a higher court. Higher court? This was the lowest court she had ever presided at. A 13-year-old lawyer, a court stenographer, who records in Polish, and the judge in African robes. Oh well, she had played Sam Westing's game. Now she would play Turtle's game. The similarity was astounding. Turtle not only looked like her Uncle Sam, she acted like him. Ladies and gentlemen, Turtle began, I stand before this court to prove that Samuel W. Westing is dead and that Sandy McSuthers is dead, but Crow didn't do it. Facing the floor, hands behind her back, she confronted each of the heirs in turn with a hard stare. The heirs stared back, not knowing if they were the jury or the accused. Grace Wexler blinked up at her daughter. Who's that? The district attorney, Jake replied. Go back to sleep. Now frowning, now smiling a secret smile, Turtle acted the, ev the part of every brilliant lawyer she had seen on television who was about to win an impossible case. The only flaw in her imitation was an occasional rapid twist of her head. She liked the grown-up feeling of shorter hair swishing around her face. Let me begin at the beginning, she said. On September 1st, we moved into Sunset Towers. Two months later, on Halloween, smoke was seen rising from the chimney of the deserted Westinghouse. Her first witness would be be the person most likely to have watched the house that day. I call Chris Theodorakis to the stand. Chris lay a calm hand on the Bible and swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. What fun! You are a bird watcher, Mr. Theodorakis, are you not? Yes. Were you bird watching on October 31st? Yes. Did you see anyone enter the Westing house? I s -s saw s -s somebody who limped. Good. Now she was getting somewhere. Who was that limping person? It was D Dr. Sykes. Thank you. You are excused. Turtle turned to her audience. Dr. Sykes was Sam Westing's friend, a witness to the will, and his accomplice in this game. On the day in question, he limped into the Westing house to build a fire in the fireplace. Why? Her next witness might answer that. Judge Ford instructed the witness to remove his aviator's helmet. His gray hair was tussled but barbered. And place your gun in the custody of the court. Oh my, Flora Bombach gasped as Otis Amber unzipped his plastic jacket, pulled a revolver from his shoulder holster, and handed it to the judge, who locked the gun in her desk drawer. Turtle was as startled as the other tenants. Mr. Amber, she began bravely, it seems that we are not all, we are not all who we say we are. In other words, who exactly are you? I'm a licensed private investigator. Then why were you disguised in this, as an idiot delivery boy? It was my disguise. Turtle was dealing with a practice witness. Mr. Amber, who employed you? That's privileged information, he said. The judge interceded. It would be best to cooperate, Mr. Amber, for Crow's sake. I had three clients, Samuel W. Westing, Barney Northrup, and J. J. Judge J.J. J. Ford, Turtle stumbled over her next question. What were you hired to do, and what, when and what did you find out? Tell us everything you know. It was unsettling to see Otis Amber act like a normal human being. Twenty years ago, after his wife left him, Samuel W. Westing hired me to find Crow, keep her out of trouble, and make sure she never used the Westing name. I assumed this disguise for that purpose. I mailed in my reports and received a monthly check from the Westington Bank until last week, when I was notified that my services were no longer needed. But Crow still needs me, and I'll stick by her, no matter what. 
I've grown fond of the woman. We've been together such a long time. How and why did Barney Northrup hire you? Amber is second in the phone book under private investigators. Maybe Joe Aaron's phone was busy that day. Anyhow, Barney Northrup wanted me to investigate six people. What six? Judge J.J. Ford, George Theodorakis, James Hu, Gracie Winklapel, Flora Bombach, and Sybil Pulowski. I made a mistake on the last one. I wasn't aware of the mix-up until I looked into Crow's early life for the judge. It seems I confused a Sybil Pulowski with the Sedell Pulowski. Would you please repeat that? The court stenographer asked. Sedell Pulowski, Ode Samber repeated, then turned to the judge. I couldn't tell you about Crow's relationship to Sam Westing. Conflict of interest, you understand. Judge Ford understood very well. Sam Westing had predicted every move she would make. That's why Otis Amber, with his privileged information, was one of the heirs. That, and to convince Crow, the Queen, to play the game. Turtle had more questions. Are you saying that Barney Northrup didn't ask you to investigate Denton Deer or Crow or Sandy? That's right. Denton Deer turned up in my report on Gracie Winquapel, the Wexlers. Barney Northrup said he was looking to hire a cleaning woman for Sunset Towers, good pay, and a small apartment, so I recommended Crow. I don't know how Sandy got the doorman's job. Mr. Amber, you were also hired by Judge Ford. I assumed to find out who everybody really was. Did you investigate all 16 heirs for the judge? I didn't investigate the judge or her partner. The judge bristled at the reminder of her stupidity. Therefore, Turtle continued, you have never investigated the man we knew as Sandy McSuthers for any of your clients. Never. One more question. It was the question she had planned to ask before learning that Otis Amber was not who he seemed to be. On the afternoon of Halloween, when we were watching the smoke in the Westing House chimney, you told a story about a corpse on an oriental rug. I saw it, Grace Wexler cried. I saw him. Turtle forgot the rules of the court and hurried to her mother. Who did you see, Mom? Who? Who? Terrified by the who's, Madame Who slipped away. The doorman, Grace replied, lifting her dazed face to her husband. He was dead, on an oriental rug, Jake. It was awful. Jake stroked his wife's hair. I know, Gracie. I know. Turtle returned to her witness. Mr. Amber, did you tell that spooky story to dare one of us to go to the Westinghouse that night? Not really. Sandy told me the story that morning, and we decided to scare you kids with it, being Halloween. Thank you, Mr. Amber. You may step down. Step down was a, ter a term used in court. The floor was level up here. Turtle turned to her baffled audience. A fire was started in the fireplace to call attention to the deserted house. Then a spooky story was told to dare someone to go into that house. That someone was me. I sneaked into the house, followed Dr. Sykes' whispers, and found the corpse of Samuel W. Westing in bed. I now call D. Denton Deer to the stand. Turtle stared at her most unfavored heir. Intern Deer, you saw the body of Samuel W. Westing in the coffin. Did he appear to have been poisoned? I could not say. He was embalmed. You are under oath, Intern Deer. Do you swear that the body, that the body of Samuel W. Westing was embalmed? What kind of a trick question was that? I cannot swear to it, he said. No, I did not examine the body in the coffin. Could the body in the coffin, which you did not examine, could have been no body at all? Could it have been a wax dummy dressed in the costume of Uncle Sam? I am not an expert on wax dummies. Yes or no? Yes, it is possible. Anything is possible. What's the brat driving at? Or is she just trying to make a fool of me? Intern dear, you may not be an expert in wax dummies, but you are an expert in medical diagnosis, and you did examine the body of Sandy McSuthers, correct? Yes to the first question, no to the second question. I did not examine Sandy. I tried to make him comfortable until help arrived. He was still alive when Dr. Sykes took over. Turtle turned quickly to conceal her smile. But surely you saw enough symptoms to make one of your famous diagnoses. She... She, dis she peered at the judge from the corner of her eye. That last word didn't sound right. Cor coronary thrombosis, the intern diagnosed, but that's just an educated guess. In simple language, heart attack. And Sandy could not have died of an overdose of lemon juice, which is what I saw Crow put in his flask. 
Turtle could have called on Angela to testify that, but she didn't want her screwy sister confessing all over the place. I never heard of anyone dying as a result of lemon juice con consumption, the expert replied. One more question, intern dear. Do you swear that Sandy had a bruise on his chin resulting from a kick? Absolutely, he said. I should know, having been the recipient of such a kick myself. You may step down. I call Sidel Pulowski to the stand. Sidel Pulowski. Overcome with excitement, the secretary had to be helped to her feet for the oath taking. Miss Pulowski, I must compliment you on your good thinking in taking down the will in shorthand. Professional habit, she replied. This looks professional, all right. The typing is perfect. Well, almost perfect. It seems you left out the last word in section three. The estate is at the crossroads. The heir who wins the windfall will be the one who finds the... Finds the what, Miss Pulowski? Finds the what? Sidel squirmed under Turtle's hard stare. Leave it to the brat to discover my one error. There was so much talking, I couldn't hear the last word, she said. Come now, Miss Pulowski, you claim to be a professional. Hounding the witness and doing it quite well, Judge Ford thought, coming to the secretary's defense. I don't think anyone heard the word, Turtle. Mr. McSuthers made a joke about ashes at that point. You are excused, Miss Pulowski, Turtle said offhandedly, her eyes on the will. The judge was right. Sandy had joked about ashes scattered to the winds. Winds. Windy windclopple. No. It just still didn't make sense. It's not what you have, it's what you don't have that counts. Maybe no word was ever there. She read on. Fourth. Hail to thee, O land of opportunity. You have made me, the son of poor immigrants, rich, powerful, and respected. So take stock in America, my heirs, and sing in the praise of this generous land. You too may strike it rich, who dares plays the Westing game. Fifth. Sit down, your honor and read this, the letter this young, brilliant young attorney will now hand over to you. Judge Ford, could you introduce as evidence the letter that brilliant young attorney handed over to you? It is just the usual certification of sanity signed by Dr. Sykes, the judge replied as she removed the envelope from her files. But the letter was gone. The envelope now contained a receipt. Check received, November 1st, $5,000. Check received, November 15th, plus $5,000. Total amount paid by Judge Ford, $10,000. Cost of educating Josie Jo Ford, minus $10,000. Amount owed to Sam Westing, zero. I'm afraid the original letter has been replaced by a personal message. It has no bearing on this case, and... Yes, please, a trembling Madam Who was stood before the judge. For to go to China, she said timidly, setting a scarf-tied bundle on the desk. Weeping softly, the thief shuffled back to her seat. The judge unknotted the scarf and let the flowered silk float down the down around the booty. Her father's railroad road watch, a pearl necklace, cufflinks, a pin and earring set, a clock. Grace Wexler's silver cross never did turn up. My pearls! Flora Bombach exclaimed with delight. Wherever did you find them, Madam Who? I'm so grateful. Madam Who did not understand why the round little lady was smiling at her. Cautiously, she peered through her fingers. Oh, the other people did not smile. They know she was bad, and Mr. Who, his anger drowned in his shame. Perhaps stealing is not considered stealing in China, said El Pulaski said in a clumsy gesture of kindness. The judge wrapped her gavel. Let's continue with the case on hand. Are you ready, counselor? Yes, your honor, in a minute. Turtle approached the frightened thief. Here, you can keep it. With shaking hands, Madam Who took the Mickey Mouse clock from Turtle and clutched the priceless treasure to her bosom. Thank you, good girl. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay, she said. The heirs were anxious for the trial to continue. They pitied the poor woman, but the scene was embarrassing. One half hour to go. Turtle was so close to winning she could feel it, taste it, but the answer still eluded her. Ladies and gentlemen, who was Sam Westing, she began. He was poor Windy Winkwapple, the son of immigrants. He was rich Sam Westing, the head of a huge paper company. He was a happy man who played games. He was a sad man whose daughter killed herself. He was a lonely man who moved to a faraway island. He was a sick man who returned home to see his friends and relatives before he died. And he did die, but not when he thought 
when we thought he did. Sam Westing was still alive when the will was read. The judge rapped for order. Turtle continued. The obituary, probably phoned into the newspaper by Westing himself, mentioned two interesting facts. One, Sam Westing was never seen after his car crashed. Two, Sam Westing acted in Fourth of July pageants, fooling everybody with his clever disguises. Therefore, I submit that Sam Westing was not only alive, Sam Westing was disguised as one of his own heirs. No one would recognize him. With that face bashed in from the car crash, his disguise could be simple. A baggy uniform, a chipped front tooth, broken eyeglasses. Sandy? Does she mean Sandy? The judge had to pound her gavel several times. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Turtle went on. Sam Westing was none other than our dear friend Sandy, the doorman. But Sam Westing did not drink, you say. Neither did Sandy. I used his flask on Halloween, and there was a funny aftertaste in my pop, but not of whiskey. I know how whiskey tastes, whiskey tastes, because I use it for toothaches. It was medicine. Sandy was a sick man, and the, the flask was part of his disguise, but it also contained the medicine that kept him alive. Turtle surveyed her stupefied audience. Good, they bought her little fib. As I said earlier, I saw Crow fill the flask with lemon juice in the kitchen, but I saw something even more interesting on my way back to the game room. I saw Sandy coming out of the library. Sam Westing, as Sandy, wrote the last part of the will after the answers were given, then locked it in the library desk with the duplicate key. But what about the murder, you ask, Turtle said, even though no one had asked. There was no murder. The word murder was first mentioned by Sandy to put us off the track. I did not die of natural causes, the will says. My life was taken from me, by one of you. Sam Westing's life was taken from him when he became Sandy McSuthers, and Sandy died when his medicine ran out. Turtle paused in a pretense of letting the heirs mull over her last words, trying to figure out what to do next. Why did Turtle, Turtle leave out Barney Northrup, the judge wondered. She knows Northrup and McSuthers were the same man because of the bruised shin. Either she doesn't want to confound the jury, or she has no more idea than I have why Sam Westing had to play two roles. Why did Sam Westing have to play two roles, Turtle wondered. He had a big enough part as the doorman without playing the real estate man as well. Why two roles? No, not two. Three. Wendy Winklopple took three names. One, Samuel W. Westing. Two, Barney Northrup. Three, Sandy McSuthers. The judge had a question. Surely Mr. McSuthers could have had his prescription refilled, or are you implying he committed suicide? Pardon me? Turtle was searching the will. The estate is at the crossroads. The heir who wins the windfall will be the one who finds the fourth. That's it. That has to be it. The heir who wins the windfall will be the one who finds the fourth. Windy Winklopple took four names, and she knew who the fourth one was. Keep calm, Turtle Alice Tabitha Ruth Wexler. Slowly, very slowly, turn towards the judge, act dumb, and ask her to repeat the question. I'm sorry, Your Honor, would you repeat the question? Turtle knows something. The judge had seen that expression before. Sam Westing used to look like that before he won a game. I asked if you consider Sandy's death a suicide. No, ma'am, Turtle said sadly, very sadly. Sandy McSuthers, Sam Westing, suffered terribly from a fatal disease. He was a dying man who chose his time to die. Let me read from the will. 6. Before you proceed to the game room, there will be one minute of silent prayer for your good old Uncle Sam. Ladies and gentlemen, heirs, for we all inherited something, let us bow our heads in silent prayer for our benefactor Sam Westing, alias Sam, er, Elias alias Sam the door, Sandy the Doorman. Crow! Otis Amber leaped to his feet as Ed Plum led the cleaning woman through the door. Chapter 27. A Happy Fourth. His aviator's helmet again flapping over his ears, Otis Amber danced up to his soup kitchen companion, flung his arms around the taut body, and squeezed her tightly. Hey, Crow, old pal, old pal, old pal. They said I was innocent, Otis. They said I was innocent, she replied vaguely. Angela, too, wanted to hug her and welcome, but closeness was not possible for either of them. Instead, Angela offered a crooked smile. Crow nodded and lowered her eyes, only to raise them to Madame Who, clutching a Mickey Mouse clock. 
Things very good, Madame Hu said, extending her free hand and shaking Crow's hand up and down. It was all a regrettable mistake, Ed Plum explained to the judge. Can you imagine? That sheriff wanted to arrest me, not Crow. Me, Edgar Jennings Plum. He wanted to arrest the attorney. Fortunately, the coroner determined that Mr. McSuthers died of a heart attack. Ads did Samuel W. Westing. Then Turtle's right, Theo said. There was no murder. The coroner was part of the plot. Ed Plum had no idea what Theo was talking about. Masking his ignorance with arrogance, he continued. I had my suspicions about this entire affair from the start. I came here for one reason only, to announce my resignation from all matters regarding the Westing estate with sincere apologies to all concerned. Wasn't there a last document? Judge Ford asked, knowing that Sam Westing had to make his last move. Yes, but as I no longer take a legal interest, please turn it over to the court, she said. Baffled by the word court, the lawyer set the envelope on the desk and found his way out of Sunset Towers. Without once clearing her throat, Judge Ford proceeded to read the final page of the will of Samuel W. Westing. 17th. Goodbye, my heirs. Thanks for the fun and games. I can rest in peace knowing I was loved as your jolly doorman. 18th. I, Samuel W. Westing, otherwise known as Sandy McSuthers and others, do hereby give and bequeath all the property and possessions in, to, in my name as follows. To all of you, in equal shares, the deed to Sunset Towers, and to my former wife, Bertha Erica Crow, the $10,000 check forfeited by Table 1, and two $10,000 checks endorsed by J.J. Ford and Alexander McSuthers. 19th. The sun has set on your Uncle Sam. Happy birthday, Crow, and to all of my heirs, a very happy 4th of July. Judge Ford set the document down. That's it. That's it? What about the $200 million? The heirs wanted to know. We lost the game, the judge explained, staring at Turtle, her, fi ma her face a mask of sad, childlike innocence as she nestled once again in Flora Bombach's arms. I think. Flora Turtle rose and walked to the side window, seeking the Westing house, which stood invisible in the moon-clouded night. Hurry up, Uncle Sam. I can't keep up this act much longer. The candle must have burned through the last stripe by now. Behind her, the, the, behind her, the discontented heirs grumbled. He made fools of us all. He played us like puppets. He was a good, good man. He was a vengeful man. A hateful man. Windcopple? He tricked us, the cheat. A madman. A stark, raving mad. Oh my, oh my, just listen to you, Flora Bombach said. You each have $10,000 more than you started with in an apartment building to boot. This man is dead, so why not think the best? Boom, boom, boom. Happy Fourth of July, Turtle shouted as the first rocket slid up the Westinghouse, lit up the sky. Boom, 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 boom. The airs gathered around Turtle at the window. Boom. Stars of all colors bursting into the night, silver pinwheels spinning, golden lances up, up, boom. Crimson flashes flashing, blasting, scarlet showers, boom. Emerald rain, boom, boom. Orange flames, red flames leaping from the windows, sparking the turrets, fire, firing the trees. Boom, cried Madame Hu, clapping her hands with delight. The great winter fireworks extravaganza, as it came to be called, lasted only 15 minutes. Twenty minutes later, the Westing house had burned to the ground. Happy birthday, Crow, Otis Amber said, reaching for her hand. The orange glow of the morning sun had just begun its climb up the glass front of Sunset Towers when Turtle set out to collect the prize. She pedaled north past the cliff, still mold smoldering with the charred remains of the Westing house. Reaching the crossroads, she turned into the narrow lane whose twisting curves mimicked the shoreline. The heir who wins the windfall will be the one who finds the fourth. It was so simple once you knew what you were looking for. Sam Westing, Barney Northrup, Sandy McSouthers, West, North, and South. Now she was on her way to meet the fourth identity of Wendy Windcloppel. She could probably have figured out the address too, instead of looking it up in the Westington phone book. There it was, number four, Sunrise Lane. A long driveway is privacy guarded by tall spruce led to the modern mansion of the newly elected chairman of the board of Westing Paper Products Corporation. Turtle climbed the stairs, rang the bell, and waited. The door opened. Turtle felt her grip of panic as she 
Her turtle felt her first grip of panic as she confronted the crippled doctor. Could she have been wrong? I'd like to see Mr. Eastman, please, she said nervously. Tell him Turtle Wexler is here. Mr. Eastman is expecting you, Dr. Sykes said. Go straight down the hall. The hall had an inlaid marble floor, no oriental rugs. Reaching its end, she entered a paneled library, this one filled with books. There he was, sitting at the desk. Julian R. Eastman rose. He looked stern and very proper. He wore a gray business suit with a vest, a striped tie. His shoes were shined. He limped as he walked towards her, not the crooked limp of Dr. Sykes, just a small limp, a painful limp. Again, Turtle was gripped by panic. He seemed so different, so important. She shouldn't have kicked him, the Barney Northrup him. He was coming closer. His watery blue eyes stared at her over his rimless half glasses. Hard eyes. His teeth were white, not quite even. No one would ever guess they were false. He was smiling. He wasn't angry with her. He was smiling. Hi, Sandy, Turtle said. I won! Chapter 28 And Then Turtle never told. She went to the library every Saturday afternoon, she explained, which was partly true. Make your move, Turtle. You don't want to be wait for, late for the wedding. The, the ceremony was held in Shin Hu's restaurant. Grace Wexler, recovered from a world record hangover, draped a white cloth over the liquor bottles and set a spray of roses on the bar. No drinks would be served today. Radiant in her wedding gown of white heirloom lace, the bride walked down the aisle, past the tables of well-wishers, on the arm of Jake Wexler. Mr. Hu, the best man, beamed with pride at her life, light footsteps as he supported the knee-knocking, nervous groom. A fine red line of a scar marked Angela's cheek, but she looked content and lovely as ever in her pale blue bridesmaid gra bridemaid bridesmaid's gown. The other bridesmaid wore pink and yellow with matching crutches. The guests cried during the wedding and laughed during the reception. Flora Bombach smiled and cried at the same time. You did a good job altering the wedding dress, Baba, Turtle said, which made the dressmaker cry even harder. A toast to the bride and groom, Jake announced, raising his glass of ginger ale. To Crow and Otis Amber. The heirs of Uncle Sam Westing clinked glasses with the members of the Good Salvation Soup Kitchen, sobered up for this happy occasion. To Crow and Otis Amber. Apartment 4D was bare. For the last time, Judge Ford stared out the side window to the cliff where the Westing house once stood. She would never solve the Westing puzzle. Perhaps it was just as well. Her debt would finally be repaid, with interest. The money she received from the sale of her shares of Sunset Towers would pay for the education of another youngster, just as Sam Westing had paid for hers. Hi, Judge Ford. I c came to say g goodbye, Chris said, wheeling himself through the door. Oh, hello, Chris. That was nice of you. But why aren't you studying? Where's your tutor? She looked at the binoculars hanging from his neck. You haven't been bird watching again, have you? There'll be p plenty of time for birds later. First, you must catch up on your studies if you want to get into a good school. Good heavens, she was beginning to sound like Mr. Who. Will you c come to see m me? Chris asked. It g gets sort of lonely with Theo away at c college. The judge gave him one of her rare smiles. He was a bright youngster. Real smart, Sandy had said. He had a good future. Sandy had said that, too. He needed her influence and the extra money, but she might smother him with her demands. I'll see you when I can, and I'll write to you, Chris. I promise. Whose little foot, foot ease, patent pending, was selling well in drugstores and shoe repair shops. Once we capture the Milwaukee market, I'll take you to China, James Hu promised his business partner. Okay, Madam Hu replied, toting up accounts on her, on her abacus. No hurry, she had many friends in Sunset Towers now. And no more cooking, no more tight dresses slid up her thigh. Her husband had bought her a nice pantsuit to wear when they called on customers, and for her birthday, Doug had given her one of his medals to wear around her neck. The secretary to the presidents of Schultz Sausages was back on the job. Her ankle mended, Sidel Pulaski had discarded her crutches. She had all the attention she could handle without them. After all, she was an heiress now. 
It wasn't polite to ask how much, but everyone knew Sam Westing had millions. Of course, she could retire to Florida, she said, but what would poor Mr. Schultz do without her? And then one forget unforgettable Friday, Mr. Schultz himself took her to lunch. Jake Wexler had given up his private practice, both private practices, now that he had been appointed consultant to the governor's inquiry panel for a state lottery, thanks to a recommendation by Judge Ford. Grace was proud of him, and his daughters were doing well. In fact, everything was fine, just fine. Who's on First was a great success. Grace Wexler, the new owner, offered free meals to the sports figures who came to town, and everyone wanted to eat where the athletes ate. The restaurant's one windowless wall was covered with autographed photographs of Brewers, Packers, and Bucks. Grace straightened the framed picture of a smiling champion, signed, to Grace W. Wexler, who now serves the number one, her, who serves the number one food in town, Doug Who. She certainly was a lucky woman, a respected restaurateur, a, life, a wife of a state official, and mother of the cleverest kid who ever lived. Turtle was going to be some days, somebody someday. A narrow scar remained, and would always remain, on Angela's cheek. It was slightly raised, and she had developed a habit of running her fingers along it as she pored over her books. Enrolled in college again, she lived at home to save money for the years of medical school ahead. She had returned the engagement ring to Denton Deer. She had not seen him since Crow's wedding. Ed Plum had stopped calling after ten refusals. Angela had neither the time nor the desire for a social life what was studying, her weekly shopping day with Sidell, and Sundays spent helping Crow and Otis in the soup kitchen. Study, 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 Turtle said. Angela saw little of her sister, who was either at school, in Flora Bombach's apartment, or at the library. Hi, Turtle. How come you're so happy today? The stock market jumped 25 points. The newlyweds, Crow and Otis Amber, moved into the apartment above the Good Salvation Soup Kitchen. The storefront mission had been renovated and expanded with money from the inheritance. Grace Wexler had supervised the decorations. Copper pots hang, hung from the ceiling. The pews were padded with flowered cushions and fitted with hymn book pockets and, and drop leaf trays. There was meat in the soup and fresh bread every day. Chapter 29 Five years pass. The former delivery boy danced into the Who's new lakefront home. Let's give a cheer. The Ambers are here. Otis came to celebrate Doug's victory, wearing the old zippered jacket and aviator's helmet. He had even let a subtle gr he had even let stubble grow on his chin. The only thing missing was his delivery bike. They had come up in the soup kitchen van. Thank you for the generous donation, Mr. Who. God bless you, Crow said. Otis and I distributed the inner souls among our people. It helped their suffering greatly. She looked worn, her skin pulled tight against the, tra the fragile bones, and she still wore black. Mr. Who, on the other hand, was stouter and less angry. In fact, he was almost happy. Business was booming. Milwaukee loved Who's little footies, and so did Chicago and New York and Los Angeles, but he still had not taken his wife to China. Theo Theodorakis, graduate of the journalism school, cub reporter, held up the newspaper, caught up the press. Olympic hero comes home. Four columns were devoted to the history and achievement of the gold medal winner who had set a new record for the 1,500-meter me run. Theo had not actually written the article on the local hero, but he had sharp sharpened pencils for the reporter who did. Take a bow, Doug, Mr. Who said, beaming. Doug leaped on a table and thrust his index fingers high in the air. I'm number one, he shouted. The Olympic gold medal hung from his neck. Confetti from the parade dotted his hair. The Westing heirs cheered. Hello, Jake. I'm so glad you could come. Sonny, as Madam Who was now called, said, shaking the hand of the chairman of the State Gambling Commission. Boom, Jake Wexler replied. Hello, Angela. Denton Deer had grown a thick mustache. He was a neurologist. He had never married. Hello, Denton. Angela's golden hair was tied in a knot on the nape of her neck. She wore no makeup. She was completing her third year of medical school. It's been a long time. Remember me? Said El Pulaski wore a red and white polka dot dress and leaned on a red and white polka dot crutch. She had sprained her knee dancing a tango at the office party. How could I ever forget you, Miss Pulaski? Denton said. I'd like you to meet my fiancé, Conrad Schultz, president of Schultz Sausages. How do you do? 
Judge Ford, I'd like you to meet my friend, Stir Shirley Staver. Chris Theodorakis was in his junior year at college. A med medication recently discovered kept his limbs steady and his speech well controlled. He sat in a wheelchair, as he always would. Hello, Shirley, the judge said. Chris has written so much about you. I'm sorry I'm such a poor correspondent, Chris. I found myself in a tangle of cases this past month. She was a judge on the United States Circuit Court of Appeals. Chris and I were both chosen to go on a birdwatching tour to Central America this summer, Shirley said. Yes, I know, the judge replied. For old time's sake, Grace, Grace Wexler catered the party herself and passed, her, passed among the guests with a tray of appetizers. She owned a chain of five restaurants now. Who's on first? Who's on second? Who's on third? Who's on fourth? Who's on fifth? Who's that attractive young woman talking with Flora Bombach, Theo asked. Why, that's my daughter, Turtle. She's really grown up, hasn't she? Second year of college, and she's only 18. Calls herself T.R. Wexler now. T.R. Wexler was radiant. Earlier that day, she had won her first chess game from the master. Chapter 30. The End? Turtle spent the night at the bedside of 85-year-old Julian R. Eastman. T.R. Wexler had a master's degree in business administration, an advanced degree in corporate law, and had served two years as legal counsel to the Westing Paper Products Corporation. She had made $1 million in the stock market, lost it all, then made $5 million more. This is it, Turtle. His voice was weak. You can die before my very eyes, Sandy, and I wouldn't believe it. Show some respect. I can still change my will. No, you can't. I'm your lawyer, she said. That's the thanks I get for that expensive education. How's the judge? Judge Ford has, been, has just been appointed to the United States Supreme Court. What do you know? Honest Josie Joe on the Supreme Court. She was a smart kid, too, but she never once beat me at chess. Tell me about the others, Turtle. How's poor saintly Crow? Crow and Otis are still slopping soup, Turtle fibbed. Crow and Otis Amber had died two years ago, within a week of each other. And that funny woman with the painted crutches, what's her name? Sidel Pulowski Schultz. She and her husband moved to Hawaii. Angela keeps in touch. Angela, and how is your pretty sister, the bomber? Turtle never knew he knew. Angela is an orthopedic surgeon. Julian R. Eastman was an old man, but suddenly his mind, too, was old. For the first time since the Westing game, he was wearing the dentures with the chipped front tooth. He had turned back to his happiest times. Sandy was dying, and he was really dying. Turtle held back her tears. Angela and Denton Deer are married. They have a daughter named Alice. Alice, doesn't Flora Bombach call you Alice? She used to. She calls me TR, as everyone does. How is the dressmaker, Turtle? Tell me about them. Tell me about all of them. Flora Bombach had given up dressmaking when she moved in with Turtle years ago. Baba as well. Everyone as well. Mr. and Mrs. Theodorakis. Remember, they had the coffee shop in Sunset Towers. They were fi retired to Florida. Chris and his wife, Shirley, teach or ornithology at the university. They're both professors. Chris discovered a new subspecies on his last trip to South America. It's named after him, the Something Christo's Parrot. The Something Christo's Parrot. I like that. And the track star. Has he won any more medals? Two Olympic golds in a row. Doug is a sports announcer on television. And how is Jimmy Who's invention going? I gave him the idea, you know. It looks like a real winner, Sandy. Mr. Who, too, was dead. Sunny Who finally made her trip to China, but returned to carry on the business. And tell me about my niece, Gracie Winkwapple. Does she still think she's a decorator? Mom went into the restaurant business. She has a chain of ten. Nine are quite successful. I keep telling her to give up on who's on the tenth, to cut her losses, but she's stubborn as ever. I guess she hangs on to it because it's in Madison, to be near Dad. He's now the state crime commissioner. He's well qualified for the job, he said. And your husband, how's his writing coming along? He had remembered. Theo's doing fine. The first novel sold about six copies, but it's got great reviews. He's just about finished with the second book. And when are you two going to have children? Someday. Turtle and Theo had decided against having children because of the possibility of inheriting Chris's disease. If it's a boy, we'll name him Sandy, and if it's a girl, well, I guess we can name her Sandy, too. 
The old man's voice was barely audible now. Did you say Angela had a little girl? Yes, Alice. She's ten years old. Is she pretty like her mother? I'm afraid not. She looks a lot like you and me. Turtle? Yes, Sandy. Turtle? I'm right here, Sandy. She took his hand. Turtle, tell Crow to pray for me. His hand turned cold, not smooth, not waxy, just very, very cold. Turtle turned to the window. The sun was rising out of Lake Michigan. It was tomorrow. It was the 4th of July. Julian R. Eastman was dead, and with him died Wendy Winflapple, Samuel W. Westing, Barney Northrup, and Sandy McSouthers. And with him died a little of Turtle. No one, not even Theo, knew her secret. T.R. Wexler was understandably sad over the death of the chairman of the board of Westing Paper Products Corporation. She had been his legal advisor. She would inherit in his stock and serve as a director of the company until the day she, too, would be elected chairman of the board. Veiled in black, she hurried from the funeral services. It was Saturday, and she had an important engagement. Angela brought her daughter, Alice, to the Wexler Theodorakis mansion to spend Saturday afternoons with her aunt. There she was, waiting for her in the library. Baba had tied red ribbons in the one long pigtail down her back. Hi there, Alice, T.R. Wexler said. Ready for a game of chess? That's the end of the Westing game. Um, thank you for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.